Adventure. Tonight, Ron Evans takes us on a terrifying adventure to seek a monster of the deep in his story called Baxter's Run. If I wasn't seeing it here with my own eyes, I'd, I'd say it's impossible. Well, there it is, Mr. Merrick. All 145 feet of it. One single tentacle. That's incredible. I've worked out the creature's size as being over 200 feet long. That's some squid, Paul. Yeah. I wonder what happened to the rest of it. Well, my guess is it was old. Perhaps died and the sharks took the body. Now, look here. See how chunks have been ripped off the tentacle? Yeah. That's right. Let's see what you mean. When did you find it? Two days ago. One of the local fishermen spotted it lying on the beach as he was passing and came ashore to investigate. When he got back to Port Hampton, he phoned me. He took a few photos and measurements and then called you. What was its condition when you first saw it? Uh, just beginning to putrefy. Well, I've seen enough here. Let's go back to your place and talk it over. All right. I'd like to see the pictures and the tissue samples you took. What you're hearing is an incident that happened a couple of years ago. My name's Paul Steadley, and I'm a South African. At the time, I was working as an observer for the Australian Oceanographic Institute. I lived in a small house provided by them, a few miles north of the small fishing town of Port Hampton. The man I'd called up from Sydney to see the great tentacle was John Merrick, the director of the institute. He had been astounded to see the massive, rotting squid tentacle lying there on the beach of a remote barrier reef island, and our minds boggled at the thought of how massive the creature had been. Back at my house, I made coffee and showed Merrick the notes I'd made. Yes. Do you mind if I take these back to Sydney with me? No, not at all. I'll send photocopies back to you. Oh, thanks. You know, about 20 years ago, a similar tentacle was found washed up on the beach in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. It was only half the size of this one. But it led to a lot of speculation at the time. The old mariners who sailed the southern seas told tales of giant squid. There are even stories of ships being overwhelmed and sunk by a giant squid. Which were merely regarded as sailors' tall stories, huh? Yes, until the New Zealand find. While we accept there is such a creature as the giant squid, we don't know its habitat or what its average size would be. It was thought they might inhabit the deep cold waters of Antarctica. But finding this evidence so far north means we must have a rethink. Yeah, rather frightening to think that a monster like this could attack a... Yes? What were you going to say, Paul? Carter. A man called Harry Carter. Yeah, what about him? He and his boat disappeared without trace only three weeks ago. Yes, I seem to remember something about it in the papers. It was thought he went on a reef and found it. Yeah, but nothing was found. Not even a splinter of wood from his boat. And then there was Peter Kane about six months ago. He disappeared while fishing over by Carver's Reef. His boat too? No, no, the boat was undamaged. It was thought he'd fallen overboard in a squall. Of course, one could go on attributing every incident to a confrontation with the giant squid, but it would be meaningless. Well, two deaths in six months is unusual, Mr. Merrick. The fatality previous to Peter Kane was about uh, 15 years ago. Yeah, all right, but let's not let our imagination run away with our senses of logic. <laughs> could be coincidental. Incidents like these do tend to run in batches. How's the fishing been along the coast? Oh, very good. Plenty of game fish in particular. The hire boats are booked solid with game fishermen coming up from Brisbane. No unusual changes in sea temperatures? No, I'd have reported it. Yeah. Well, I'd better be on my way back, I suppose. Oh, right. by the way, I've heard you're planning to return to South Africa after Christmas. I haven't been home in six years. Will you be staying there? Well, that depends on whether I get a good job. Well, if you can't, come back to me. There are a few promotions in the offing. You know? <laughs> I'm tempted, Mr. Merrick. I love the Great Barrier Reef. There's always something new and strange happening here. Yeah, <laughs> like the giant squid. <laughs> A 
week later, Merrick called me from Sydney. We've had a meeting and come to a decision. I'm sending a man called Mark Batford to you. He'll be followed by Errol Dixon with a large quantity of equipment. What we've decided is to search your part of the barrier reef for further evidence of giant squid. Mm. <laughs> and I can tell you, Paul, what we saw on that beach has set the whole world buzzing with speculation. Uh, what kind of equipment, Mr. Merrick? Dixon will be arriving by sea on a specially equipped research vessel. It's called a Sea Leopard. Uh. On board will be a miniature submarine and a diving bell, both equipped with all the latest underwater gadgetry. Hmm. Sounds like it'll be an expensive and serious operation. It will be, Paul. We're getting donations from all over the world. Anyhow, Bedford should arrive there tomorrow. He'll fill you in when on the finer details. What I'd like you to do in the meantime is look up some of the local history as far back as you can. See if any other lives have been mysteriously lost. All right. Then point them on a chart and see if some kind of a pattern emerges. You know, it's just a shot in the dark, I know. That day, I drove 30 miles either side of Port Hampton, questioning and buying drinks for the old-timers. I was surprised by the results. Between 1895 and 1980, there were 38 deaths reported, but not witnessed. First thing next morning, I visited Port Hampton Library and worked my way through the official records. It took a long time. It was the middle of the afternoon when I got back to my cottage. I began marking up a chart, as Merrick had suggested. And that was when Mark Bedford arrived. Hello. Paul Stedley. <laughs> How do you do? You must be Mark. Come on in. Oh, thanks. Uh, leave the door open, will you? Keeps the place cool. <laughs> uh, something to drink? Ah, uh, thanks. Long and cold. It's been a long, hot drive. Right. Ah, uh, you been living here long? Yeah, three years. You find it lonely? Oh, peaceful. I can always run into town if I feel like whooping it up. <laughs> that uh, accent. South African, isn't it? Yeah, not many people recognize it. Well, I spent two years in Durban during my wild and misspent youth. <laughs> Mainly surfing. Oh, I'm from Durban. I'm going back there at the end of the year. Oh, yeah? For good? Maybe. Not sure. Take a look at this, Mark. Ah. Is this the chart? Mm. Merrick said you were making one up. Hey, all these dots are fatalities? Yeah, a lot, aren't there? And these are only deaths of people who've gone missing. Those lost due to bad weather and witnessed mishaps aren't included. And they talk about the Bermuda Triangle having a bad reputation. There was a long lull between 1925 and 1980. Only four deaths in that period. Yeah. But the heaviest loss of life occurred between 1911 and 1915. Twenty-two deaths. But now we've had two unexplained deaths in six months. And the possibility of a giant squid in the area? Yeah, well, look at the chart. Now, nearly all the deaths occurred in Baxter's Run. See, that's this area bounded by these three islands. Deep water, as you can see. Yeah. Yeah, I've counted them already. Twenty-nine of the 38 disappearances happened there. Why is it called Baxter's Run? It's named after a pioneer fisherman at the end of last century. He always used it as a shortcut home when the weather turned against him. Yeah. At that time, the other fishermen wouldn't use it because it hadn't been chartered for reefs. And he's the one who went missing. Yeah. Alfred Baxter, January 1903. You know, this is damned exciting stuff, Paul. When the sea leopard gets here, we could search the entire area in a month. We'll know every damn fish by its first name. <laughs> <laughs> Where was the squid's tentacle found? Uh, here, on one of the islands bounding Baxter's run. But I'll tell you one thing, Mark. I'm glad it's you going down there and not me. <laughs> Don't be, Paul. Merrick said you and I would make the preliminary dives together. What? <laughs> The next morning, rigged in our scuba gear, we set out in the Institute's motor launch for Baxter's Run. It was a fine day, and the water was like glass as we cut our way through it. First, I took Mark Bedford to the beach, where the remains of the tentacle still lay putrefying in the hot sun. Then we took the launch a hundred yards off the beach and made our first dive into the majestic underwater world of the coral. <sighs> I was scared sick, believe me. So was Mark. But neither of us was admitting it to the other. Well, nothing exciting to see down there. Uh, plenty of small fish. Nothing bigger than a foot long. Yeah. Well, we'll take one more dive and call it a day. What, here? No. 
Take the boat about half a mile out that way. Right. It's pretty deep there. Oh, how deep? Fifty to eighty fathoms. Yeah, that's too deep. Keep closer in shore, Paul. Somewhere along there. Yeah, well, I'll have to be careful of submerged reefs. <laughs> I got a feeling you don't want to go diving again. Yeah, you could be right. But if it has to be done... Yeah, it has to be done. Merrick will be expecting a report from me tomorrow. Yeah, well, the sooner the sea leopard arrives, the happier I'll be. Hey, stop. What? Cut the engine. What is it? Over there. Can you see where the water's been disturbed? Yeah. Oh, it could have been caused by a porpoise. Like hell was it a porpoise. It was something a lot bigger. A white shape lying along the surface, about 50 feet of it. And it suddenly went under. Yeah, well, whales have been known to... That was no like... bloody whale, Paul. Wrong colour for a start. And a whale doesn't have suckers along its side. What? You mean that... You're damn right, I mean. That was one bloody great tentacle lying along the surface. Well, I can steer over and take a closer look. <laughs> Are you kidding? I've seen all I need to. Besides, this scuba deer is as much use to us as a pair of white fronts in a gas attack. <laughs> well, do we just sit here, then? Ah, I've seen enough to report back to Merrick, so let's clear out. Right. Skirt along the shore. Keep it to the shallow water. If that thing took a grip of this boat, it'd turn it into splitters with one squeeze. Oh, yeah, absolutely, Mr. Merrick. Well, I'll keep the news under wraps for a while until we've found something substantial. Right. Oh, I had a call from the Sea Leopard earlier. She'll be arriving at Port Hampton late tomorrow afternoon. Oh, yeah. You can brief Federal Dixon and the skipper and then start diving at the weekend. Right. Oh, by the way, he'll show you some special gear I've had fitted. Anyway, Mark, if you don't get any results by next Thursday, I'll fly up and see you. Right. Phone me again tomorrow, will you, when you've talked to Errol? Cheerio. Cheerio, Mr. Merrick. Oh, he was pleased? Oh, yeah, out of the moon. <laughs> oh, where's that drink you promised me? Yeah, right under your nose. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, here's to happy hunting. Yeah, and may it stay happy. Next afternoon, Mark and I drove down to the small harbour of Port Hampton. The sea leopard had just birthed, and we went on board. Captain Anderson showed us into his cabin, and in a few minutes we were joined by Errol Dixon, who was to be in charge of diving operations. I've been studying the charts of this Baxter's Run. There'll be no problem for my ship, so long as I keep well off the southern shore of this island here, the one called the Shoe. Obviously because of its shape. Oh, yes, Captain, that's how it's got its name. Merrick told me over the radio that you saw physical signs of a giant squid yesterday. Yeah, well, Mark saw it. All I saw was a slight disturbance on the surface. Could you see how big it was? Well, it was a brief glimpse, but I'd say it was big enough to wreck the motor launch. Well, that doesn't tell me much. Yeah, Merrick told me you had a secret weapon. Well, a new piece of equipment, as he put it. Oh, that. Well, one of the problems we have is what to do when we spot this creature. Yeah. Uh, taking pictures isn't enough. We want the whole thing back in Sydney. Have you any idea how big it must be? Well, hold on. We've got it all worked out. The squid will be hit by a special harpoon built on the principle of a hypodermic needle. Hollow inside and attached to a 30-meter length of plastic tubing, through which will flow a constant supply of tranquilizing fluid. Yeah, okay, so far. What else? Well, he gets wrapped in several layers of heavy-duty plastic. That'll keep him nice and cozy for a few days while we tow him down to Sydney. Tow him? Yeah, it'll work. How do you know the tranquilizer will work? It's been thoroughly tested on every variety of squid. It works, Mark. It'll turn him into one great lump of jelly when we turn on the happy juice. Yeah, well, I hope you realize what you're about to deal with. Oh, don't worry. We'll make our first dive Sunday morning using the mini-sub. You'll keep tracking us from the surface, Mark. Once he's been located, we'll go down in the bell and give him the harpoon treatment before he can turn nasty. Yeah, but he could turn nasty when you're in the sub. There are two tranquilizer harpoons built into the bow. One shot, and he's flying cloud nine. Yeah, have you thought what would happen if, by chance, the tranquilizer doesn't work? Yeah, sure. The harpoon has an explosive head. 
Mm. Any hairy situations, and boom, he becomes a few tons of minced calamari. Yeah, and maybe the last of its species. No way. Where there's one, there must be more. Well, they might have been breeding in this Baxter's run for years. There could be dozens of them in the deepest part. <laughs> Come on, don't look so glum. This party is going to make us famous. Or dead. Mark and I watched from the main deck as the Derrick lowered the mini-sub to the water. The Sea Leopard was anchored directly above where Mark had seen what he thought was a tentacle. For half an hour, while Errol Dixon and Billy hadn't prepared for the underwater voyage, we'd carefully scanned the surface for telltale signs. Then our attention was taken up by the submersile's departure. The upper hatch was battened down and the vessel was cast off from the cable holding it. We went from the deck into a specially constructed communications room and called into the sub, which was, oddly enough, called Cricket. Hello? Leopard to Cricket. Do you read? Yes, I read. We're down to 180 feet. The water's clear, and it's still a long way to the bottom. I'm making a spiraling descent. I'll call you back when there's something to report. Okay. Good hunting. Three thirty feet, Errol. Yeah, okay. Raise the planes one degree and uh, make a wider circle. All right. Uh, not many fish about. Just a few tiddlers. Hey, watch it. There's a coral pinnacle ahead. Uh, now go around the back of it. Uh, no, no. Wait, wait. Turn to the right, Billy. Oh, do you see something? I'm not sure. The water's murkier, as though something moved. I'll put the searchlight on full beam. A cricket to sea leopard. I'd say we're about 40 feet from the bottom. Visibility is sharply reduced, and I, I can see no more than about... Arrow, hmm? there it is. Yeah, hang on, Sea Leopard. I think we got him. Yeah, we just passed over him. I saw it quite clearly. Okay, okay, we'll go in a half circle. Planes three degrees down. Right, video camera on. Cricket to Sea Leopard, switch on your video monitor. Keep the channel open and record. We're going in to take a closer look. We, we've got you, Errol. There is... Dead ahead. Stop motor. Well, well, well. Did you ever see the likes of that? Oh. You got him, Sea Leopard? Yeah, in gorgeous technicolor. He's lying quite still. But gee, the body's as big as a house. <laughs> Wait till old Merrick sees this. I wouldn't advise you to go any closer, Al. It's okay, it's okay. We're going over the top. Oh, do you think we should go up a few feet? No, no, we'd lose visibility. Switch on the motor. Half speed ahead. Oh, wow. It's lying there quite passive. Just just like a movie star posing for publicity pics. It's eyes, Errol. You see, it's eyes. Yeah. As big as manhole covers and staring at us. Right. Planes up one degree. Okay. Now we're going right over the top of his head. Yeah, what was that? Did we hit something? Full ahead. Something hit us. And I'll bet it was Charlie Boy's tentacle. Uh, and another arrow. The cricket slowing up. Hard right. Uh, try and aim the harpoons at it. Oh, we're moving only one way, and that's down. The damn thing's squeezing us. We've lost you on the screen, Errol. We're coming down in the belt. Oh, you better hurry before it opens us up like a ripe banana. Oh, it's all imploding. Oh. Hurry up, Mark. We don't have long. bell was slung over the side and the winch lowered us into the depths as quickly as possible. It was constructed to withstand pressures at 15,000 feet and we were confident that not even a squid of this size could open it up. We'd heard Errol Dixon's radio go dead and knew that the worst had happened. All we hoped for now was to be able to harpoon and tranquilize the monster. The bell had no motive power of its own and was directed by radio to Captain Anderson in the Sea Leopard's wheelhouse. We dropped lower into the water anxiously peering out of the observation ports. At 200 feet, our descent slowed, and at a signal from Mark, stopped some 15 feet above the bottom. The water was cloudy from its recent disturbances. There was nothing we could do for Errol Dixon and his partner, so we settled down to wait for the water to clear. 
The bell was fitted with two harpoons in fixed positions. Aim could only be controlled laterally by means of a motor that swiveled on the end of the ship's hawser. Attached to this hawser were several pipes. One supplied electrical power, another our air supply. A third contained the tranquilizing fluid, which we hoped we'd have a chance to use. Links to Sea Leopard. Can you move slow ahead on a bearing 233? Three, three. Visibility's improved to ten yards. Can't see anything of note. Keep to that bearing and stop every minute until you hear from us. There are a number of coral pillars around and we don't want to foul them. All right, Mark. We're moving slow ahead now. Oh, this is tricky. We could easily get fouled. Oh, I know, John, but it's the only way. Unless... Unless one of us goes out, you mean? Yeah, that's it. Even trickier. Yeah, I agree. Ah, Look! Captain, stop and go astern. We're right on target. Right. Good luck. Look, if we don't stop, we're going to go right over it. Yeah, and make the bloody harpoons useless. Anderson should be going astern by now. Yeah, our swing is slowing down. Yeah, if we could just stop here, it'd be perfect for a shot. Hello, Captain, are you going astern? Yes, we're on our Okay, way to... okay, stop. Drop us ten feet and hold your position. We want to sit just above the bottom. Right, stop it. John, keep your fingers crossed. We come down in the right place. Right now, even my toes are crossed. <laughs> oh, that's it. We stopped. And we're going down. Great. We couldn't have done it better under our own power. Oh, we've stopped descending. And there he is. Staring at us. No sign of the cricket. Yeah, the wreckage is probably lying over on the other side. Yeah. Now, keep one finger on the harpoon button. We need to swing around a few degrees. The damn thing's just sitting there staring at us. Yeah, not for long. Perfect. Now watch this. Right between the eyes. Are you ready, John? I'm ready. Fire! <laughs> Got him! Ah, quick, switch on the happy juice. I saw the harpoon plant itself between the staring eyes. The creature seemed to rear up, inflating like a gigantic balloon. Suddenly the water all round turned a deep purple. The bell was jerked several times and then all fell silent and still. Charlie Boy, as the ill-fated Errol Dixon had called him, was flying on cloud nine. It took that afternoon and most of the following day to recover the bodies of Errol and Billy and to raise the giant bulk of the squid from the depths. The plastic tubing of tranquilizer was fitted into the huge body and several layers of plastic were wrapped about it. The ingenious arrangement allowed seawater to flow through and the outer skin was inflated with air until it seemed as though an immense barrage balloon was floating astern of the sea leopard. My work was finished and I went off by launch back to Port Hampton while the sea leopard headed out for the open sea on its journey to Sydney. On the second day, the sea leopard experienced a mild storm. Wilt, shut that ruddy bridge door. Yeah, that's better. What were you seeing, Mark? Oh, I just wanted to know what the latest weather report's like. Oh, it's abating. The wind's already dropped 15 knots in the last hour. And the sea? <laughs> Could be settled down by tonight. You look worried. Yeah, well, I just don't want to lose Charlie, boy. Oh, there's not much risk of that. He's wrapped up tight as a golf ball. <laughs> Look, I want to go over and check as soon as possible. Yeah, I know it means stopping for a little while. Well, there is something wrong, isn't there? It's a tranquilizer tube. There's very little of the liquid being absorbed. I have a queasy feeling in my guts that there's either a leak or the heavy weather has pulled it loose at the other end. All right, well, that's possible. And we're pitching rather heavily for a time. All right, you want me to heave to now? Do you mind? Oh, I can turn about and lower a boat on the lee side. Take the boats and the three seamen with you. Uh, thanks, Captain. You'll be taking the weight off my mind. Hey! That was a heavy roll. Captain! Captain, come and look at stairs! That's all the excitement, laddie. Oh, good grief! Charlie boy's breaking free like a monkey from a paper bag! The 
men stared in awed horror through the rear bridge window. Two enormous tentacles had attached themselves to the stern of the ship, and eight others were reaching farther forward. The main bulk of the monster was still behind the ship, but drawing closer. We'll have to do something. Have we got any means to harpoon it? No. Well, you see the size of it, man. It could pull us down if it tries to climb aboard. I'll try and shake it off. Hell, it won't go hard to port. We stood staring with horror as the colossal squid firmly affixed itself to the ship and slowly, inexorably began to draw itself on board. The stern dipped from the increasing weight and then the sea leopard began to list to starboard at an ever-increasing angle. It was then that Captain Anderson was forced to recognize the awful truth. Stop steering, buddy! We have to abandon ship before she capsizes! Two days later, three wretched survivors were picked up from a battered ship's lifeboat. All that was ever heard again of the sea leopard. And Charlie Boy. High Adventure is produced by Henry Duffenthal.